Good morning. Now, when we were choosing what to do for 40 days this year, uh, I thought waiting was a great idea. Um, and there were other possibilities floating around, but I, I was pushing for waiting. And part of the reason is because I know that I need that. There's a lot for me to learn here. And if you doubt that for a moment, ask Fiona how I responded when a supermarket delivery that was supposed to come uh, late Friday night just didn't turn up and I was waiting and waiting and nothing happened. And uh, let's say there's room for growth for me in this. So, so waiting is a really useful thing for me to be looking into. But when in planning this series, we landed on the story of Joseph uh, as our example of someone who waited, uh, I had my reservations because uh, initially I thought, well, it's not very relatable because most of us are not like Joseph. We're not marked out for greatness uh, early in life and we don't end up as the second in command of a major world power. Uh, but I came to realise as we looked into the story more that although the details of what Joseph did uh, are very different from the details in our lives, uh, all the experience that he had along the way is very much the same as ours. And that is very relatable. It's delays and it's troubles. And let's quickly review uh, some of what Joseph's experiences were then. I want to look at three uh, little sections. First, early on in the story, remember Joseph had this dream. Uh, he says uh, he told his brothers about it. Listen, I have another dream, he said. The sun and the moon and 11 stars bowed low before me symbolizing his father and mother and 11 brothers. And skipping on a few verses, as Joseph was probably expecting some kind of anointing ceremony or, or some great thing. Instead, it says, when Joseph arrived where his brothers were, they ripped off his beautiful robe and grabbed him and threw him into a pit. And then when some traders came past, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the pit and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. Now, imagine... How Joseph felt having thought something great was coming his way and finding something terrible instead. Now this is a recurring theme. So here's what happens. He's, he gets sold as a slave in Egypt and in Potiphar's household where he's working as a slave. He does very well and he rises through the ranks and becomes uh, the leader of the household. It says Potiphar soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. But again, a few verses later, just as Joseph was thinking, ah, oh, okay, maybe that dream is coming through now. Instead, he's falsely accused, he's framed of attacking Potiphar's wife. And it says Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison. That's in Genesis 39. By the way, the first bit was in Genesis 37. And now we look in uh, Genesis 40. So Joseph now is in the jail. And he's been interpreting dreams for other people who are in the jail with him. God has been speaking to him and showing him uh, what these people's dreams mean. And Joseph brings this um, story to the cupbearer. He, he says, this is what your dream means. The three branches that this guy had dreamed about represent three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift you up and restore you to your position as his chief cupbearer. And please remember me. And do me a favour when things go well for you. Mention me to Pharaoh so that he might let me out of this place. And a few verses on. Pharaoh then restored the chief cupbearer to his former position, just as Joseph had said. Pharaoh's chief cupbearer, however, forgot all about Joseph, never giving him another thought. Now again, you see, for a third time, Joseph's hopes would have been raised. He would have thought, OK, this is it. It's finally going to happen. You know, I'm going to come to the attention of Pharaoh and all those great dreams about the high position that God had for him were going to come true. But that's not what happened. Uh, and in fact, the Bible tells us it was two more years after that before Joseph did eventually um, get summoned out of his prison. So why did Joseph have all this trouble? Well, the first thing I want to say is we shouldn't be surprised by troubles. The Bible is unapologetic, actually, in telling us to expect trouble. Jesus himself, in John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 33, says these words. Uh, and do you notice you never find these words on fridge magnets or bookmarks? Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Do you know, I want to launch a, a range of greetings cards with, with unhelpful Bible verses. Except actually they're not unhelpful, because they're the reality. And they are what the Bible is telling us. Do you remember in small groups last week, uh, we looked at the verse at the beginning of James's Gospel when he says, When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. 
Uh, but actually, there are a whole bunch of different New Testament passages I could have picked uh, by all different authors that make very similar points. Let's have a quick look at some. Here's Paul writing in Romans chapter 5. He tells them, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. But if you don't believe James and Paul, then here's Peter, first chapter of his letter. The trials will show, he says, that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. But if you don't believe James and Paul and Peter, then uh, let's see what it says in the letter to the Hebrews. We don't know who wrote this, um, but here's what he says. My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and punishes each one he accepts as a child. So you see this thread running all the way through the New Testament over and over again. We're warned to expect trouble and that's what it's going to be like. Uh, and if anybody ever tells you that you should become a Christian because then all your problems will go away, I'm afraid that person is misleading you. Uh, possibly they misled themselves. That is absolutely not what the Bible teaches us. So we're going to have troubles. Now, did Joseph understand what was going on, I wonder? We can look back at the things he went through and say, oh yes, here God is teaching humility and here he's teaching him what it's like to be a slave so that he can have more compassion when he's a ruler. And, you know, we have this perspective and we can look back and read all these things in. But I doubt Joseph understood any of that at the time. And he would have been wondering, why are these troubles coming on me? And that's what we wonder as well, isn't it? There are at least six possible reasons. I'm sure there are plenty more, but these are just the, the ones that occurred to me. Here are six possible reasons why we might have troubles. One is that God is testing us. Another one is maybe Satan is attacking us. We have an enemy. We live in enemy-occupied territory. The enemy wants to make things bad for us. Here's another more positive one. Perhaps God is disciplining us, um, as it talks about in Hebrews, and so strengthening us and bringing us more into line with the character he wants us to have. Here's a fourth possible reason for troubles. We brought them on ourselves by our own bad decisions. And I think we've all had that experience at different times. Another reason consequence of a fallen world which is living a world where things are not the way God intended them to be and sometimes for that reason things are going to go wrong for us or here's the sixth reason which we don't maybe talk about much it's just sheer bad luck maybe sometimes things just don't work out the way they ought to work out so when you face troubles when you're in difficult circumstances as really we all are at the moment in the middle of the virus I think we often tend to ask ourselves, well, what's going on? Why is this happening? And maybe which of these six things or other things is a true explanation? Is this a test? We may ask ourselves. I remember one time feeling under pressure for some reason I don't even remember now, but I was out praying about it and, and sort of in frustration, I almost cried out, God, is this some kind of test? Um, and as soon as I'd said that, I realized the answer to my question was, it doesn't matter whether it's a test, just pass it anyway, whether or not. God has set it as a test. This is the circumstance I'm in. So all you can do is respond to the circumstance. Now, we can't control our circumstances, and God doesn't expect us to do that. But we can control how we respond to them, and that is what God expects us to do. So what about understanding the troubles that we're in? I imagine at the end of his story, Joseph was able to look back from his position of prominence and power in Egypt and look over all the experiences he'd been through and see the hand of God in it after the event. And probably that brought him a lot of comfort. But can we rely on that happening always? I don't think we can. Think about the story of Job, the oldest book in the Bible, most scholars think. And he is a good man. We're told he's good. And he suffers through 40 chapters. Um, family disasters, physical sickness, friends who are supposed to be his friends, just making things worse by talking to him about the situation. And the thing is, although the book of Job tells us the reason for his suffering, and it's to do essentially with um, a, a bet that Satan makes with God, it's really surprising, very strange. Don't have time to go into it now. But we understand why Job's suffering happened 
What I think is really interesting and really important is that Job never does understand that. God never explains it to him. He never sees. And you know, a lot of the while, we're not going to understand what's happening to us. And some of what's happening now, we might look back on and never really feel that we understand why God made us go through this. So what is it that keeps us going? Well, in Job's case, the, the late chapters of the book of Job are all about his encounter with God himself. Now, God doesn't speak to Job about his suffering. He doesn't give him an explanation. He doesn't give him an excuse. Far less an apology. What God does is reveal his own character to Job. And a lot of the words in that section are to do with creation, the glory of creation, and the stars and the animals. And in doing that, what God is doing is unfolding to Job an aspect of himself that Job can understand and see and recognise through the greatness of creation how very much greater the Creator is. Uh, and of course God himself speaks and that is where Job's strength comes from. And in the end of the book of Job, that's enough for him. That's what carries him through. He never understands. He doesn't need to understand because he knows the God that he's dealing with and that counts for so much more. And actually, the same was true with Joseph. Now, this is a little half verse. It's hidden away in, um, you know, there's three chapters of Joseph's story in Genesis. And it's just half of one verse. Uh, you can look it up if you want. Genesis chapter 9, first half of verse 21. It says this. But the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. Now, I'm pretty confident that that is what carried Joseph through. In the hardest of his hard times down in a pit, sold as a slave, wrongly accused, uh, ignored and overlooked for years while other people were getting out of jail. In all that time, what got him through? Not understanding what was going on, not even thinking back to the, the great dream that God had given him as a teenager, but the knowledge of who God is. The Lord was with Joseph in the prison, it says, and showed him his faithful love. And in the end, for every one of us, whatever our circumstances are, however frustrating they are, however much we feel like things are being shown to us and we're, we're invited into a good thing and then wham, something comes that, that, that breaks it down and it doesn't happen. In all those circumstances, the Lord is with us and showing us his faithful love. And in the end, he is the one thing we can rely on. We can't rely on our circumstances. We can't rely on the, the idea that we have properly understood necessarily even what God is calling us to and, and what our dreams and visions and aspirations uh, really mean. But we can rely on God himself. He is our foundation. The Lord is my rock, David writes. The Lord is my rock, my stronghold and my salvation. In another place he writes that God lifts him up out of the miry pit and, and gives him a firm place to stand. And it's God himself who is and must be our foundation in the toughest of times.